Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And today I will speak on the topic of positive and negative attitudes in life and in spiritual life. <clears throat> so basically, for every one of us, there is something inside us which shapes our vision of the world. Two people may see the same view, but they don't take the same view. They may see the same thing, but they see it differently. Because whenever we see things, it is not just that the object is here and we are here. It's between the object and us, there is our mind. And our mind shapes our every view. And broadly we might say positive and negative attitudes means if there is a glass of water that is half empty or half full. To see it as half empty is to be negative, pessimistic. To see it as half full is to be optimistic, we may say. But that is a very simplified understanding of positive and negative attitudes. See, the, the way our mind shapes our vision is not just by how we see things right now, but how we also see the pattern of things. That means one way of thinking negative is, oh this glass is half empty. But another way of thinking negative is, oh this glass is full, but it is not going to stay full for long. Things always run out. So, the way we think, see things in, in static and in action. So, our attitude shapes everything that we look at. So much so that broadly speaking, we can say that based on their attitude, there are two kinds of people in the world. Some people are wise and some are otherwise. <laughs> So, when we have these two categories of people, and it's not just some people are wise and some are otherwise, the same person, we ourselves are sometimes wise and sometimes otherwise. So, what shapes the way we think? Now, why do some people, even if something good is happening, they are always fearful? Oh, this good thing is going to end and something terrible will happen. And some people, even bad things are happening, they are looking, okay, something good will emerge from it. So, what shapes the way we think? And how can we reshape it? Now, our, the basic, at, before I answer this question, now some of us may be practicing spiritual life also. Maybe we come and come to a temple, maybe we do some mantra meditation, maybe we do some kind of exploring of spirituality. And in some ways, this is transformational. But quite often, we bring our attitudes into our spiritual life also. That means, not only our perception of the world will be shaped by our attitude, but our perception of God will also be shaped by our attitude. So, if something bad happens to someone. Maybe they meet with an accident or they get some disease or something like that. A person with a positive attitude might say that, okay, this bad thing has happened, okay, something good will come out of it. Or if we have a more philosophical understanding, we understand that actions have reactions. So we all carry some baggage of karma with us. Karma is basically the correlation between action and reaction. So each one of us, the, the kind of family we are born in, the kind of looks we are born with, the kind of IQ we are born with, all this is shaped by our actions before birth in our previous lives. And we all have, just like we may have a bank balance, we all have a karma balance. Some good, some bad. And by our present actions, we are either adding to the good or adding to the bad. And by the situations that we face in life, we are sometimes exhausting our good karma 
and sometimes we are exhausting our bad karma. So when we face difficulties, when we are going through problems, which karma is getting exhausted at that time? If you are going through difficulties, yes, the bad karma which you got is getting exhausted. So, and then we are, when we are, when good things are happening in our life, that means some of the good karma is getting used. So, basically, if something bad is happening in someone's life, a person with a positive attitude may say that, oh, actually my bad karma is getting exhausted. Hmm. Or somebody who has a basic, basic negative attitude, they may come, they may be practicing some kind of religion or worship and they may say, something bad has happened, oh, maybe God is angry with me. And if God gets more angry with me, I'll suffer even more. So, now if we have this attitude of negative projection, we might say recently why I took this topic was that recent I answer questions on my website, the spiritual scientist as well as mentioned. So I recently got a question only yes, just some time ago that somebody asked, there was a big festival like we had Janmashtami a couple of days ago. And I did not fast for the festival. And two days later, I lost my job. So is God punishing me because I did not fast and that caused me to lose my job? Now, why should we have this kind of negative imagination? God is not vengeful. And fasting is just something which we do to express our love for God. We want to focus entirely on him, not distract ourselves with food. But once you start imagining like that, once a person has a negative vision of life, they have a negative vision of God also. God is a loving person. He is not a punishing person. Yes, there is accountability for our actions, but accountability is very different from vengefulness. So, they are two very different things. Accountability means what actions we do, we get consequences of that. Vengefulness means there is somebody out there out to get us for some perceived or actual wrong that we have done. So, so the point I am making is that we carry our at basic attitudes into our spiritual life also. And it shapes our conception of God, it shapes our conception of uh, even the spiritual practices that we do. It is always there with us. Now, first thing is that Positive thinking is not always good and negative thinking is not always bad. Why? Because sometimes positive thinking can make, make us unrealistically optimistic. The word in English is Pollyannish. Some people are just, they don't see any problems, any dangers at all. So, sometimes a capacity to think negatively is also helpful. If you are making a big plan for a big project, okay, what all may go wrong? We have, to, we have to debug that in advance. So, it's if we tend to think positive or if we tend to think negative, we needn't, we needn't blame ourselves for that or just pride ourselves for that. This is the way my mind functions. Be aware of that. In any project, we need some people who are creative, they come up with ideas. In any project, we need some people who are critical. Hey, I don't think this is going to work. The problem is not being optimistic or being, being pessimistic. The problem is being compulsively optimistic or compulsively pessimistic. That means we may habitually think negative, because that's the way our mind works. That's okay, if you are aware of it, we can deal with it. But when we compulsively think negative, that means we just can't look at the positive side of things. That is where it becomes a problem. So, now when we come and practice, when we start practicing bhakti or we start exploring spiritual life, at that time we might have different conceptions. Some people practice religion or spirituality or whatever name they have for it out of negative emotions. It might be guilt or fear. Guilt is the idea that if I don't do this, I will be displeasing God. We all in our relationships probably know people who constantly try to send us on a guilt trip. You know, they will tell us, 
I am doing so much for you, can't you do even this much for me? So, now, nobody likes to be sent on a guilt trip. But, we don't like to feel guilty also, so we might just go along. And we might do things, but when we do something because somebody has induced guilt within us, that doesn't bring us closer to that person. We might do it, but that doesn't enhance the relationship. So, what applies to our relationship with others also applies to our relationship with God. If somebody is practicing spiritual life out of guilt, oh, why this is what? Oh, why? If I don't do this, then oh, I'm such an ungrateful person. Oh, I am. I, God is displeased with me. Now, if we are doing it like that, that is a very negative conception. In fact, uh, uh, within some religions, guilt is considered to be like the central truth of human life. Say. The idea was the original human being sinned and because of that all of us have inherited sin as a genetic defect. And everyone is from birth sinful and unless we are saved by God's grace we remain sinful. So often that awareness of sin is emphasized repeatedly and guilt is induced to make people practice spiritual life. But the Bhagavad Gita doesn't have that mood at all. So, the negative emotions with which one might practice bhakti is guilt and fear. But that has no room. In the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is confused. Should I fight? Should I not? What should I do right now? So, Krishna basically focuses on two things in the Bhagavad Gita as inspiring Arjuna to practice spiritual life. That those two things are knowledge and desire. Knowledge means that we don't have to think of God as someone who is out there to judge us and punish us. See, God, Krishna, He loves all of us. And he, His purpose, He is present in our hearts. And His purpose is not to catch us when we do wrong. Hey, you did this wrong? Now take this punishment. Some people, the joy of their life is to find faults with others. They are constantly looking all over. Their eyes are like heat-seeking radars. Who is doing what? What fault? Find it and proclaim it to the whole world. So, fault finding is often accompanied by gossiping. Gossip, what is, what is gossip? See, gossip essentially means when we hear something we like about someone we don't like. <laughs> when we hear something we like about someone we don't like, then immediately, oh, I want to tell the whole world about it. So now God, God's purpose is not to catch us when we do wrong. His purpose is to catch us when we fall. Krishna in this sense is like a mother. No, uh, a mother, if she's a, a small child, is just learning to walk. And the child slips and falls. The mother doesn't just start clapping, oh, you fell down. You see. The mother runs over there and catches the child before the child falls. So, so that is the mood of Krishna. Krishna is his pita hamasya jagato, mata dhata pita maha. He's the father, he's the mother. He is the grandsire, he is our be all and end all. So, this guilt or fear based relationship with God is not very healthy. So, what Krishna focuses on is knowledge. So, one aspect of the knowledge I said is God is here to help us rise and grow. His purpose is life affirming, not life denying. When we link with God, Actually, we become empowered to live our life more fully. For all of us, God is present within us and He is the inner light. He is the inner light who can light our heart and He can light our world. And through each one of us, if we become a channel for God's light to come through, 
then we can not only light up, we can actually change ourselves and change things around us for the better. So God's presence within us, within our life, our heart is meant to be life affirming. But when there is light, we can, we can walk and move more productively. When there is darkness, we just stumble and fumble and sometimes collapse. So knowledge, now what is this knowledge? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in 7.19 Bahunam Janmana Mante Gyanavan Maam Prapadyate Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlabha So he says Vasudeva Sarvamiti Vasudeva Sarvamiti means that Krishna God is the, is the be all and end all of everything. If some people think like there is a hierarchy of being and God is the boss at the top. That, okay, I am in my office, above me is my boss, above my boss is their boss. Like there is a big hierarchy and God is at the top of that hierarchy. That is one understanding, but that is not the complete understanding. Because God is not just the best of all beings. God is the basis of all being. He is the basis of all being means Everything that exists is sustained by him. So that means God is not separate from us. We are part of him. That means whatever abilities we have, they have been given to us by God. Whatever strengths, whatever virtues we have, they are all, whatever positivities we have, they come from God. And so, once we understand that God is the basis of all being, that means my ability comes from God, my existence is based on God's existence, then we see that when we try to connect with God, when we serve Him, we care for ourselves in the deepest possible way, in the fullest way. So this knowledge of our intrinsic connection with God, just like if the hand wants to eat some food, the hand can't eat the food on its own. The hand can't take a gulab jamun and scratch it or chew it or toss it or crush it and get it nourishment. The hand just takes it and offers it to the stomach and the hand gets nourishment. So like that, God is not separate from us. We are parts of Him. And therefore, when we have this knowledge, then when we try to serve God, it is understanding that this is the most enlightened way I can take care of my deepest interests. Now normally we may feel, okay, but if I come to a temple, I chant, I do some reading of sacred texts or whatever, but what do I gain by it? If it is serving my interests, what do I gain by it? Actually what we gain is that we start purifying our minds. The more we have this, with this knowledge of Krishna, when we start practicing bhakti, the basic disposition of the mind I talked about, either negative or positive, that starts changing. The impurities within our mind start decreasing. And thus, whatever situation we are in, we look at the things that are right and we feel satisfied. Otherwise, Often we look at the things that are wrong and we feel dissatisfied. So basically, if we consider any situation in our life, then this is the list of things we have. And it's a list of things we want. Now we can look at the things we have and be satisfied. Or we can look at the things we want and be dissatisfied. Now most of us think that success or happiness comes in my life when I can move more and more things from this box of what I want to what I have. But the problem with this is that no matter how many things we move from this box to this box, from the box of what I want to what I have, if our mind is disposed to keep looking at the box of what I want, what I don't have, then no matter how much we have, we will stay dissatisfied. So here, 
the thinking that causes dissatisfaction is based on the mind's attitude of always looking at what we don't have so suppose after this program there is prasad well no suppose prasad is there <laughs> so you have food to have but suppose there is a special kind of menu wherein everyone gets a different dessert so one of you has gulab jamun one of you has peda one of you has barfi one of you has sandesh one of you has rasmalai one of you has shrikhand mm -hmm. now say i have got something delicious on my plate say i have got sone papdi now instead of looking at what is in my plate i start looking at what is in his plate and what is in her plate and what is in his plate and what is in her plate what will happen no matter how delicious the food be with me i'll be dissatisfied so basically no matter how good the food be with me and even if i get all the desserts from 100 other plates onto my plate i cannot eat so many desserts also but even if i get them still there will be somebody with some other desserts so for satisfaction we often think i don't have these 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 things that's why i am not satisfied but that is not entirely true as long as our mind is habituated to looking at what we don't have we can never be satisfied uh, to be happy is possible but we want to be happier than others and that is impossible to be happier than others is impossible always so now why am i talking about this in relationship with devotion that when we understand that god is the basis of all being that he is the source of all attractive things and he is present in our own hearts then that knowledge helps us to shift our vision away from the things that we don't have toward inwards toward the gift that god has given us and the gift that god himself is by being present in our hearts and then knowledge is one thing after that is desire we can connect with god not just through the rational side of us but also the emotional side of us we want to channel both our faculties so we all may have some little desire now some all of you have come to this program so you have some little desire to explore something spiritual some of you may be committed to practicing some things that also indicates some desire now we all have many desires in the world in life and desire is intrinsic to consciousness because we are conscious we naturally desires and we need to find out because there are so many desires within us we cannot possibly fulfill all the desires the desire that is which desires should we try to fulfill by which we can attain contentment in life suppose there is a classroom and whenever a teacher asks any question there are some children who just start speaking very loudly now just because somebody is speaking loudly doesn't mean automatically that they are speaking correctly we won't just if somebody speaks loudly we won't necessarily give them the mic to answer the question you see who answers properly so same applies to what happens inside us there are many desires within us which scream loudly and often we get caught in fulfilling whichever desire is the loudest but just fulfilling our loudest desire is no guarantor of happiness just as the loudest student doesn't necessarily speak the truth speak the correct answer so the teacher will evaluate the answer so we have we have the desires that are loudest and we have the desires that are the deepest the deepest desire for the soul is to connect with the whole to connect with god with krishna because in that connection what happens is we connect with the one who is the source of all happiness we connect with the one who is the supreme being who is the source of all happiness and when we connect with him connecting with him is like connecting with a reservoir of 5 billion dollars then 5 dollars 10 dollars everything that is automatically taken care of 
so so what we all have some desire to connect with god and when we practice bhakti based on that positive disposition knowledge and desire no spiritual knowledge and spiritual desire then we will move forward positively in our lives and the power of devotion is such that in every situation that we may be in our lives we can actually start experiencing contentment so i'll talk about a couple of short stories and then we can have some question answers once there was a villager who lived in a very broken down village and while living in that village there was no proper roads over there no proper houses no proper food no proper facilities at all and then he was petitioning the local authorities please fix this please fix that please fix that and something was very fixed but soon it would get unfixed and things were not moving forward and one day while he was in his farm he saw a magnificent horse going by and then he saw on that horse there was the king of that kingdom now the first thought that came in his mind is hey i have these issues let me ask the king to fix it if i put a word to the king the king will fix it all but then he thought no it's a king so he said oh i oh you your highness i'm so delighted honored to see you please i have my cottage nearby can you please visit my cottage and the king was surprised the king was always habituated to having people ask favors for him so when he saw he was not asking any favor so he said okay he said i am busy now but since you are so graciously invited i will come after a week to your house and then as he passed by he was charging ahead and some courtiers came behind him and then the king told what had happened now when the courtiers came to know oh this king is going to visit this person's house he said let we need to make sure that things are suit, everything is suited for the king and when they came to the house he saw all oh, their house was broken he said we'll fix this house and they saw the road it's broken they said we'll fix the road and they said oh there are no facilities over here there's no water over here there's no sanitation so let's fix it all so what happened by the time the king came everything was already fixed for him so he could have asked the king for doing small small things and he could have asked the king for himself and when the king came with the king everything came so similarly for us there are many things wrong in our life and our mind can keep looking this should be fixed that should be fixed that should be fixed yes there are many things which need fixing but actually it is we who need fixing the most because we have become disconnected from our source from our whole so if we invite god into our heart then It, the more god becomes present in our heart and he starts guiding us from within even if miraculously things don't seem to get fixed we will get guided from within about how to fix things because once god's presence is there within us with that comes calmness with that comes clarity with that comes confidence and these three are extremely powerful assets calmness clarity and confidence and once we have these then whatever ability we have we can use it to the fullest capacity and thus by bringing god into our hearts by putting god first we will fix many other things in our lives so this is based on desire now we may have desire for many things but here based on his intelligence this king chose to desire the king not the favors of the king and the favors came automatically because he desired the king something similar happens in the mahabharat when before the war is going to take place the two warring cousins pandavas and kauravas they are forming allies and both of them arjuna duryodhana and arjuna go to krishna and krishna is a very powerful king with a very powerful army and both of them want us help 
when they come there at that time krishna is resting and arjuna being a devotee gently goes and stands near krishna's feet and then duryodhan is is that a timer for me to end the class <laughs> okay so krishna as so a duryodhan goes and stands near krishna's head and then krishna wakes up and the first person he sees is one who is at his feet arjuna oh arjuna welcome and then gets up and says oh duryodhan you are also here what can i do for both of you and duryodhan says that no that we want your assistance i want your assistance in the war he says i have also come for the same purpose arjuna says oh lord and then duryodhan immediately says i came first krishna smiles and he says but i saw arjuna first and duryodhan is still upset he said okay and moreover he is younger to you let him have the first chance and then krishna says i because both of you are related with me i have decided i will not fight in this war and i will have my army which will fight on one side and there will be i who can be an advisor a consultant for you and now duryodhan thinks you know such a big army and i could have chosen that and arjuna got the first chance and then arjuna says oh krishna i want you and duryodhan thinks oh arjuna is such a big fool he has chosen he has left the whole army just for one unarmed un- non combatant what a fool but externally he puts on a show and it's oh, okay oh krishna if he has chosen you then i'll have to accept your army internally is gleeful and then duryodhan departs krishna and arjuna hug each other and then krishna asks arjuna arjuna why did you choose me instead of my whole army he says oh krishna he said that with narayan you are narayan with narayan all his sena automatically comes and without narayan his sena is like a zero and later on now we don't have this is a whole separate class but throughout the mahabharat at the critical moments when arjuna was in trouble krishna as a counselor guided him krishna gave him those three things calmness just right before the war when he was overwhelmed and confused krishna made him calm krishna gave him clarity when his son abhimanyu was killed and arjuna was overwhelmed with grief and anger krishna calmed and pacified and clarified things for him and when during repeated fights especially when he had to fight against his own grandsire other places when he was disheartened krishna gave him confidence and that made all the difference for him. so krishna helped arjuna win the war without fighting as without shooting a single arrow and krishna's role in the mahabharat is representative of god's role in the world krishna seem inactive over there krishna seem to be a non combatant over there and similarly in the world god seems to be a non combatant god seems to be in inactive invisible but god is present in our hearts and from there he can do magic in our hearts and he can bring magic into the world so for each one of us if we understand this life affirming nature of god's place in our life that god is our relationship with god is meant to affirm and fulfill our life not deny our life or fill us with fear and guilt then we can approach god and approach life with positivity and each one of us if that inner light of god we allow that to manifest through us by connecting with him in knowledge and desire affection then each one of us can make the light world brighter and to the extent we stay disconnected from god to that extent we lose and the world loses our inner world stays darker and we make the world darker so every one of us 
our life can acquire enduring profound meaning if we link with god and that is the life affirming message of the bhagavad gita and that's why arjuna at the end of the gita is enlivened ready to face whatever challenges life has sent his way and similarly if we understand god and bhakti properly through the bhagavad gita we will also become energized and affirmed in our life to face whatever challenges life sends and to shine brighter within and to make the world brighter without i'll summarize i spoke on the topic of how positive and negative attitudes can be there in life and in devotion so positive vision is not just seeing the thing good that is there right now but it can also be not just in static but also in dynamic things may be bad but if i look at things will become good that's positive things may be good but if i say that things are going to become bad in future that's negative so positive and negative visions can come in our spiritual life also based on how we perceive god if we think of god as a vengeful punishing person and we live in fear and guilt then that is a negative conception of god that's unhealthy now a positive conception of god is based on knowledge and desire that god is not just the best of all beings is the basis of all being we he is not separate from us we are part of him so when we serve him we care for our deepest interests and we can satisfy ourselves in the deepest possible way and then when we have this positive vision then whatever little desire we have our desires are distributed over many things and often we spend our lives fulfilling our loudest desires but what will bring fulfillment is fulfilling our deepest desires and what is what is the deepest desire that is the desire at the level of our soul so i talked about these two stories the story of the the poor person who asked the king to come not to bestow some favors like that instead of asking god for fixing this problem fixing that problem we ask god to fix us to fix us in our relationship with him to become present in our hearts and then he will give us calmness clarity and confidence and then i talk about how arjuna chose krishna against his army and although krishna didn't fight at all the key moments krishna guided arjuna and arjuna emerged victorious so krishna's role in the mahabharat war mirrors god's role in the world he is invisible and seems inactive and thus people think he is inconsequential inconsequential but from within he can guide us he can calm us give us calmness clarity conviction and can dramatically change the trajectory of our life for the positive so our relationship with god is meant to affirm our life not deny us in our life and the light of god is within our hearts and if with our negativity we, we don't turn towards god then we make the world that much dimmer and darker and if we connect with god with positivity then that inner light of the of the lord can illumine our hearts and illumine our world through us thank you very much hare krishna So any questions or comments? Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhuji, for your wonderful lecture. Last year I attended your lecture, and I met you last year. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, not one actually, or maybe you can divide it up in one, perhaps. My first question to you is that what is a bad karma? and what is a good karma or is it a relative term or just love krishna and do whatever you want to do everything will be good karma okay so what is good karma what is bad karma are they relative or if we just love krishna then everything that we do we do will be good karma okay see what is good and what is bad how do we decide this broadly in three factors over there there are some people who have the idea that morality or ethics is categorical this is the category of right and this is a category of wrong 
So say for example, speaking truth is good. Speaking lies is bad. This is a categorical understanding of ethics. And it is important to get this categorical understanding right. But it is not just categorical. It is also contextual. Why? Because say, if there is a murderous mob out to chase a friend of ours, and that friend, friend comes in our house, please save me. And we hired him in a, some attic in our house. And then the mob knocks on the door. Is he here? Now what should you do at that time? If we have this categorical understanding of ethics, we will speak the truth and we will cause the death of that friend. So, based on context, sometimes speaking a lie can be the right thing. So, basically context means what? There is category and before in context means what comes before the action, what comes after the action. What comes before the action is the intent and what comes after the actions is the consequence. So, contextual ethics means we accept that right and wrong are categories, but it is not watertight categories. It is also to decide what is right and what is wrong, we have to con consider three factors. Then. The nature of the action, the intent for the action and the consequence of the action. So, you know, piercing somebody with a needle is bad, but if a doctor is piercing somebody with a needle, that is good. So, it is not just categorical. So, intent, content and consequence, we will have to look at all these three things to broadly decide what action is good and what action is wrong. Now, with respect to the second part of your question, if you do something for Krishna, uh, does, does that make everything right? It depends on our consciousness and it depends on our devotion. If we are truly devoted to Krishna, and we are truly working for Krishna's pleasure, then we will never do anything which is bad. But if we start self-righteously or in a self-congratulatory uh, self way, start rationalizing our wrongs in the name of God, then that's 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 very unhealthy. So there are times when in, in devotion we might go from this one category to another category. But that has to be done very, very, con very cautiously. So, it is not just the, it is the purity of intent, if it is there, I am just doing this to please God. Then, sometimes apparently bad things can be good. But that is not a license for doing anything wrong and saying that because I am doing this for God, it will be good. So, that if we try to, if we try to use God, to justify our wrongs, then we are horrendously wrong. That is not the way things work. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone, we will come back to you. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes. There are a lot of questions. Okay, Martha, you can ask, you can send the mic till there. You can ask, I will repeat. Okay, so how do we distinguish between the deep desire and a loud desire? Yeah, so generally a loud desire is something which comes as a very strong urge. Just do this, do this, do this. And generally even if the children cry loudly, now they are not going to cry loudly for 24 hours a day. When they cry loudly it is unbearable. But it is for some time. So, generally the loudest desires are like urges. They come and when they rise, they seem unbearable. And then they go down. And after some time, it is like a sine wave. They may rise again also. But a deep, deep desire is something which is something which we, which is like a constant aspiration of the heart. It is something which may, we may not always be conscious of also. Because if we are too caught in the world, there are, see, each of us can think of things we want to do in our life someday. Yes. So why? Because we are caught so many caught in so many, so caught in so many other things. So those deep desires are, we could say it is, if I was not obliged to do anything, 
obliged by my responsibilities in the world or obliged by my own mind and senses which have their own pullings then what would it what would it be that i want to do so we also need some knowledge to understand our deeper desires but in general in our even in our moments of clarity whenever we are in the mode of goodness if we observe ourselves we may say this is what really matters in my life and sometimes if we uh if we are confronted with some some life altering cal- calamity say if some loved one passes away or if we are also confronted with a fatal disease then we start asking what, what really counts so we don't have to go through that kind of situation but if you do a thought exercise my father is going to die what would really matter for me what would really count so right now i might have a very loud desire i want to go and watch this movie but at the time of death would i really value oh i watched 10500 movies in my life no that would really count so considering from the ultimate perspective that means when we put in when we when we distance ourselves from the immediate and we think from a long term perspective we can start sensing our deepest desires ultimately the soul's deepest desire is to connect with krishna and the connection with krishna is not just by directly practicing bhakti yoga but is also by using whatever gifts we have in the service of krishna so that inner connection and based on the inner connection an outer contribution because so that is the broad uh, direction of our deepest desires now specifically how we establish that funny connection how we make that contribution that will vary from person to person okay thank you yes hari krishna thank you again for a wonderful class you have an amazing way of making your point so simply it goes straight to the heart and makes so much sense i want to thank you for that happy to question i have for you is uh, you talk about a number of things like the greatest desire being wanting to connect with god and connecting with the deities of calmness um clarity and confidence etc we talked about you know inviting to the to the heart and correcting ourselves and we have heard this many times in different ways and we understand our challenges in casting that into application in our life so there's still desires that are not connected to the to krishna that take precedence um uh, they are louder and somehow or other get busy trying to satisfy them So how to make a transition to say all those things we have heard today and before are the ones we need to apply in our life. Okay. So how do we make the transition from what we have heard to applying it? One of the best ways to do something challenging is to is counterintuitive to set the standard of success so low that failing is impossible. What that means is that <laughs> begin with small simple steps s s s sometimes if i say from now onwards uh, i am going to be serious about my spiritual practices now now when you we make a goal like that well there is no success there is only failure in that i might be very serious for the next 30 days but on 31st day when i have a lapse it is all a waste so what happens is instead of having that kind of goal where we think of i will do something for the rest of my life we may want to do it for the rest of our life but if you think of it that way then what happens there is no no success in that so whatever it is that we want to add to our life just take small simple steps that means okay today i'll try to do this today i will maybe read the bhagavad gita read the bhagavatam for i just make it 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes whatever at least this much and then if you do that see inside us our mind can sometimes be like a bully and sometimes the mind is like a tender child so when it wants to when it's forcing us to do bad things it's like a bully but when it is doing something good it's like a tender child it also needs encouragement 
So if you do one good thing, just be kind to yourself. Appreciate Good job. And thank God. Thank you that I was able to do this. I could have made a mess of this, but I did. And often life can be discouraging. And especially if you want to live a life of spiritual principles, we often struggle and it can be discouraging. So if an ideal inspires more regret than reform, if an ideal inspires or causes more regret than reform, then we need a more attainable intermediate ideal. We don't reject that ideal, but we need, need an intermediate ideal. So which is attainable for us? So just like a small child needs encouragement, needs appreciation. So like that, when we are able to do something good, we appreciate. Not in self-congratulatory sense, but in an encouraging sense. Good job. And not in, and again, you should thank God. Thank you that I was able to do this. And yes, let me do something more. So that's the way we can start doing what we want to do in small, simple steps. And the other aspect is, whenever we say we want to commit ourselves in a particular direction, there are some things which we want to do and there are some things we want to give up. Now, in general, it's best not to focus on what we are, what we don't want to do. Because it is, as soon as you think, I will not do this, it seems like life denying. Any resolution, I will not do this, is a resolution that a dead person can keep better than a living person. <laughs> I will not oversleep. I will not over browse the social media. I will not do this. Well, a dead person is not going to do any of those things. So any negative resolution immediately feels life denying to us. So the dead person has no life. So a dead person can do no, uh, no better than us. So yes, we have to give up certain things, but don't focus on what you will not do. Focus on what you will do. And rather than saying I will not do this, what can I fill my life with? And then if I fill my life with this, automatically that will go out of my life. Okay? Thank you. So thank you. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki. Hare Krishna. Thank you.